Welcome, excuse me. welcome to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and a special welcome to those watching us on YouTube. I'm Damani Davis. I'm one of the reference archivists here at the National Archives, and I'm also NARA's subject matter expert on records relating to the African American experience. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live recording of, of the Black and Appalachia podcast with our special guests, Dr. Nkeshi el Dr. Karita Brown, Ron Carter, and William Isom II. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with our current exhibit, Power and Light, Russell Lee's Cold Survey, which is currently on display in our Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. The exhibition features more than 200 of Russell Lee's photographs of coal miners and their families in the form of large-scale prints, projections, and digital interactives from a nationwide survey of housing and medical and community facilities of bituminous coal mining communities. <clears throat> the exhibit will be on display through December 7th, 2025. Before we get to tonight's program, I would like to tell you about two upcoming programs here at NARA. On Tuesday, October 29th at 6 p.m., authors Dennis Hale and Mark Landy will join archivists of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogan, for a conversation about their book, The First Migrants, Keeping the Republic, a Defense of American Constitutionalism. That program will take place in the archivist reception room, which is entered via the Pennsylvania Avenue side of this building. On Monday, November 18th at 6 p.m., we will present the next installment of our virtual series, Inside the Vault, as author and historian Donald Miller will discuss his book, Masters of the Air, America's Bomber Boys Who Fought the Air War Against Nazi Germany. He will be joined by executive producer Kurt Sadusky, who turned the book into a recent hit HBO series. This program will be seen on the National Archives YouTube and Facebook Live channels. And many of the records they discuss in these books can be found either here at the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., or our facility in College Park, Maryland, depending on which record group is involved. And now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to our panel. Dr. Corita Brown is a sociologist, professor, oral historian, and public intellectual whose research centers on the fullness of black life a proud graduate of Temple University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Brown University. She currently teaches sociology at Emory University. She has authored several book books, including The Sociology of William uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and the award-winning The New Brownies Book, A Love Letter to Black Families. Her upcoming book, Battle for the Black Mind will be published by Legacy Lit, Hatchet Book Group. Ron Carson is the co-founder, with his late wife Jill, of the Appalachian African American Cultural Center in Pennington Gap, Virginia, and, and his vice chair of the 400 Years of African American History Commission. The AAACC is located in the Virginia coal fields and works to preserve the stories of black families in extreme southwest Virginia, eastern Kentucky, northeast Tennessee, and southern West Virginia. Carson also retired as the Black Lung Program Director at Stone Mountain Health Services Black Lung Program in Virginia. The hosts of tonight's discussion are William Isom II and Dr. Nkeshi el -Amin. William Isom II is a sixth generation East Tennessean, East Tennessean and co-founder of Black in Appalachia, where he coordinates the project's research, community database development, uh, film and photography production, oral, oral history collection, and educational events in conjunction with local residents. 
uh, Dr. Nkeshi el -Amin. She is a community sociolog so sociologist in Atlanta, Georgia. She currently, she's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Ag Agnes Scott College. Her research, her research exploring the link between race and place is focused on how racial practices shape black places and how black people in turn are involved in practices that define, contest, and reimagine places. Would you please welcome tonight's panel on the, on the stage. What's up, DC? DMV. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey. I am Dr. Nkeshi el -Amin. I'm a sociologist of race and place and black Appalachian experiences. And this evening with me are... William Isom, the director of Black and Appalachia. And... Karita Brown, professor of sociology at Emory University. And, and Ron Carson, uh, the founder of the Appalachian African American Cultural Center. And this evening, you all are tuned in to a live recording of the Black and Appalachia podcast. podcast. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> so this is, has already been a reunion for us. We've, made, uh, we've met so many faces that we know. We all know each other here. Um, some of you we know in the audience, but some of you, this is your first time meeting us. And so we'll start by just sharing a little bit about us and what we do. William, take it away. Yeah, Black and Appalachia has been going on for about 11 years now. This is our 11th year. And we started out as a project with East Tennessee PBS in Knoxville, uh, producing short, locally specific documentaries about black life in East Tennessee. Uh, since that time, we've kind of expanded and kept doing different things, census data collection, GIS mapping, uh, the digitization of school records, and um, a podcast, which is the most popular thing we've ever done. Of course it is. I'm the one that's doing it. <laughs> um, so the podcast is our newest, well, maybe not our newest, but we've been doing it for about four or five years now. Um, and the idea with the podcast was that we wanted to reach new audiences, especially younger audiences. We've been collecting all of this uh, material, all of these stories for, for many years, and we wanted to get the, wor the, the, the words, the stories, the material into the public, right? And so. Uh, we decided to, to work on this podcast, and uh, it has been a wonderful journey, right? Uh, this podcast and all of the other work that we've been doing with Black in Appalachia has brought us to this stage, and we're super, super excited to be here. Thank you, National Archives, for inviting us. <laughs> yeah, and one of the, the things I was particularly excited about was coming here in conjunction with Russell Lee's photography exhibit. If you guys haven't seen it yet, it's going to be running on and into next year. But um, just to kind of give you some context on that, Russell Lee was, was basically hired by the federal government to document life in coal camps, not just in central Appalachia, but also in Utah and Wyoming in the far west. And that project came out of, basically there was a lot of labor unrest with the UMWA and coal operators right after World War II. And so as a mediation, uh, uh, between the, t the two parties, uh, Truman agreed, as part of that agreement, to conduct a health and welfare survey of coal camps. And Russell Lee was the photographer that was uh, hired to do it, and he helped produce this medical survey. And um, the photographs are not just kind of this bureaucratic record of coal communities, but it shows the broad and, and broad life, broad spectrum of life in coal camps. There's churches, there's schools, there's kids, there's little kids with their naked butts out. And Absolutely. Yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> great. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, and so you know, we had a chance to experience the exhibit earlier today, and it just resonated with us, right? It resonated because it mirrored so many of the stories that we've heard over the years, uh, talking to you know, our, our, our folks in, in these communities. And so you know, I really appreciated especially how the life you feel in these pictures, right? You're not just looking at labor um, and hardship, but you're looking at everydayness, right? And so we really, it just add another layer to our work. And, and, and there are lots of black pictures in there, so we like it even more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and so, 
you know, in, 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 in the stories that, um, that we have collected over the years, we've told many coal mining stories or coal mine community stories on the podcast, right? You've heard about in-migration to the region. You've heard about uh, everyday life in the region, in, in these communities. Today, we wanted to tell a different story, right? We wanted to talk about out-migration from coal communities. And so we invited our friends, uh, Karita and Ron, to share stories with us and to just have a good conversation. So we're going to jump right in. Yeah. So. Uh Mr. Ron Carson, can you tell us a little bit about your community, like where are you from, and, sure. and, and your relationship to coal in that space? Sure. Um, the first 17 years of my life, uh, I am from the coal fields of Southwest Virginia, um, uh, and um, I was never, I never lived in a coal camp, but there's a place called St. Charles, Virginia, which is about maybe eight miles from Penton Gap back in the 19th. 50s and 60s, there was a large black population in the, uh, the coal camps there. So I spent most of my weekends in the coal camps of um, Blue Diamond Code and Black Diamond Code and the commissary and um, the barber shops. And, and they had what was called juke joints back in those days where they played music and checkers and everything. So the, the first 17 years of my life was pretty much surrounded in the coal camps of uh, uh, Southwest Virginia. What so, you do in them juke joints? Yeah. <laughs> well, we dance. You know, we, they call them piccolos. Where you, you put a nickel in, you got like five records and, and everything. So. No tales yet. So you didn't live in the coal camps, but you went there to party. I went to the coal camps <laughs> because that's where the black people were mostly living at. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Brown, what about you? Tell us about your connection to uh, coal communities in Appalachia. So I am from Long Island, New York, but I'm a product of a long line of uh, black coal miners and black coal mining families who uh, came through eastern Kentucky, uh, Harlan County, Kentucky, uh, as miners through the long African-American Great Migration. So my mother and father, are both from Lynch, Kentucky, and my grandparents, they actually are the ones who first uh, moved to Eastern Kentucky from Alabama and settled uh, our family's lives there for at least two generations. Um, so my, both my grandfathers, uh, Major Brown and Thornton Davis, they worked for U.S. Steel and the mines in Lynch. I see some folks nodding out there uh, for almost their whole adult lives. Um, and these jobs were so very um, important. They opened up an entirely new uh, universe of opportunities for uh, black families like the one I come from during this particular time in the early 20th century. Um, the coal mining industry, uh, well, at least in Lynch and Benham and the company-owned coal towns in Harlan County, they were uh, company. They were fully owned by the company. So that means that U.S. Steel owned the homes, they owned the mines, they owned the schools, they owned everything you thought. Okay, the stores, the churches, they, the churches, they the even, hospitals. <laughs> they even had script. You know, script their own money. form of currency that uh, miners and their families could use. Well. During this time of the early to mid 20th century, you have to remember that this was a period of uh, legal segregation in the United States, the Jim Crow South. Um, and these model uh, co company-owned coal mining towns were kind of these little bubbles. So while they were still segregated, my parents attended segregated schools, the churches were segregated, they followed those norms. By virtue of my grandfathers being able to opt into those coal mining jobs, they were able to take care of their big old families. My grandmothers had 11 kids on my mother's side, 16 kids on my father's side, and my grandfather's salaries were sufficient to take care of the whole family. Therefore, my grandmothers did not work in white women's homes like most black women did um, during those times. They were housewives. And that's the context that my parents grew up in. They were these children of black coal miners growing up in these 
coal communities that were full of industry. The mines were always going 24-7. You had trains coming in and out, moving through Appalachia, heading to Pittsburgh and um, um, other stops in the Midwest to go into steel production. So it was heavily industrial, but also embedded, mm -hmm. nestled in these beautiful mountains full of trees and crisp air and just a contradiction really of nature and industry. And that's the context that, again, my family, but so many other black families uh, in that part of Eastern Kentucky experienced. And I'm a product of that. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, looking at the pictures on uh, the exhibit, you can kind of see some of that, right? That everyday nest, that the, the joy on the faces of the kids, right? Um, and it's not to denounce the fact that we're, they're living in the Jim Crow, in Jim Crow America, but you still see the sort of protection that these these different family structures mm -hmm. might be able to offer to, to black kids in this space that maybe may not be for their cousins elsewhere, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about the out-migration. Ron, can you tell us a little bit about your out-migration story? Sure. Um, I was a third-generation coal miner. I worked for Westmoreland Coal Company in Andover, Virginia, which is in, was in Wise County. Um, I lasted for about 10 months. <laughs> 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 and uh, it, it really wasn't the work that um, didn't make me like um, coal mining. Uh, I just didn't like getting dirty. Uh, the coal dust, uh, just, it was just awful. So, uh, but I left in, in 1973 um, and moved to Boston, Massachusetts, um, where I stayed for um, the next couple of decades. Um, but I did move back. Um, are we getting into coming back home now when we talk about that? We can get back in that a little bit. Tell us about why, like, what, how did you, tell us about that trip to, because that had to be like Country Mouse goes to town, right? Oh, so you're yeah. leaving Pennington Gap. And yeah, it, it, it was a major cultural shock. Um, leaving um, a town of about 1800 and going to um, Roxbury, Massachusetts at the time. I have never seen that many black people in my life. Uh, as I said, it was a total culture shock. Um, he was a, a country boy who went to a little one-room school uh, in um, Pennington Gap, um, going to a, a major city. How'd you get there? I had by, by Greyhound bus, and it took me two days to, uh, to uh, get to Boston from, uh, from Pennington Gap, Virginia. Uh, it was uh, a major, major cultural shock. What'd you do when you got there? Well, um, my, I had an uncle and aunt who uh, actually moved to Boston in the, in the early 50s. Um, I stayed with my aunt, my aunt Thelma. Um, I got a job in uh, Harvard Square at the Harvard Coop. Um, I was a store detective. I would catch shoplifters um, for, for, for about a year. Uh, and then I decided that I needed to further my education, so I enrolled into BU on Commonwealth Avenue and um, major in criminal justice. And I eventually became a warden of, of a prison in, uh, in Boston called Deer Island House of Correction in Winthrop, Massachusetts for about 17 years. Um, but there was a point that I wanted to move back home after, after a while. But, go ahead. You go. I was no, gonna no, ask Ron, did you, did you have, did any of your peers also make this transition at that time? Uh, yes, um, the little one room school that, that I attended, that was probably 25 to 30 of us, and I would say 20, 20 of us mm. left, left the area. Some went to Detroit, to Columbus, um, New York, uh, and I ended up, uh, ended up in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so very few of us stayed. Um, in Southwest Virginia during that time. You met a lady while you were in Boston. Yes, I did. Tell, tell us yes, about, tell um, us how y'all met. Yes, tell us um, about that lady. I met my <laughs> wife, Jill, um, who's uh, actually deceased now, but I met her in uh, 1975 at, at BU. Um, we got married and um, we lived in Framingham, Massachusetts for many years, and then we decided one year that we wanted to, uh, I wanted to come back home. 
uh, being the only child, no siblings, my parents was aging. So um, we, we sold our home in, in Framingham and we came back to Pennington Gap and uh, built a home and I've been there ever since. My wife passed away in 2023 and um, uh, so it's been sort of difficult, but, um, but we're moving on with the culture center. Well, I'm back with you. Um, can we talk a little bit about your family's story? Tell us about the in-migration mm. and the out-migration. Mm. Yes, I, I love this question because um, it doesn't always come to top of mind when we're talking about coal communities or Appalachia broadly to think about black folks, mm -hmm. right? Um, but as the beautiful exhibit upstairs, and I just really encourage everybody, if you haven't seen Power and Light yet, please go enjoy that gorgeous exhibition. You see that uh, many coal towns, especially during the time of the highest productivity during when um, uh, coal was mined manually, these towns were very diverse, okay, with African American coal miners and also many uh, immigrants from Europe mm -hmm. who were coming from Poland and Ireland and Italy, uh, southern and eastern European countries coming from Ellis Island straight to these coal camps um, in, in throughout Appalachia. Now how did black folks get there, uh, at least to Harlan County? Well, these coal companies were pretty smart and they had a strategy in mind. You see, there's a little secret about Alabama, which is where all my grandparents are from. Mm -hmm. Alabama is the most resource-rich state in the South in terms of mineral deposits. You have coal, iron, and ore mines right there in Alabama. And in the early 1900s, like when my grandfathers were coming up, a lot of men were put to work in those mines through the convict leasing system, okay? So this was an exploitative um, uh, system of slavery by another name, as Douglas Blackman would call it. Well, uh, companies like U.S. Steel or International Harvester that were setting up these coal towns pretty much out of nowhere, uh, they knew that they could recruit skilled black laborers who knew how to work the mines right there in Alabama, and they would go and send labor agents down to Alabama and sneak those men, those black men, to, um, to Lynch, to Harlan County. That's, that's one of the main mechanisms through which African American families got there. My grandfather, Major Brown, uh, he didn't come with a, a labor agent. He actually hitchhiked yeah. on a train, um, uh, hoboed is what they called it. Uh, but there were just many ways in which uh, African Americans knew that they could have an opportunity to uh, set up a life for themselves that weren't that wasn't completely dictated by the oppressive structure of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. So not to say that that didn't exist in um, in Harlan County, Kentucky, but it certainly wasn't the same level of uh, closed opportunity as it would have been for them in the South. So that's how my family and many, many other black families got to Eastern Kentucky, but they were the last to be hired, mm -hmm. the first to be fired. And as soon as mechanization came to the mining industry, who lost their jobs first? Mm -hmm. Who had to move first? Who were kicked out of their homes first? It was the black families. Mm -hmm. So. My parents' generation, it wasn't even a second thought. They were told from second, third, fourth, fifth grade by their teachers, their parents, and every other adult in the community, you better figure something out because once you graduate high school, you can't stay here. Mm -hmm. There are no jobs for you here. So they had migration on their minds as kids. They were birds of passage. They knew they had to go. And I'm a product of that intergenerational migration through Appalachia. Mm -hmm. There was, but there was family relationships that already existed in these other places mm -hmm. that people plugged into, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, very much like Ron, your story with your auntie and uncle. Yes. I mean, you know, and this is what was so dynamic about uh, the 20th century, the African American Great Migration. This was a time where black folks were on the move. I'll give you a little statistic. I can't help myself because I'm a sociologist. I have to. Uh, in, by 1910, 90% of the African American population in the United States lived in the South. There was no such thing as what we know today as a chocolate city, or how if folks say urban communities, you know they mean black community. That was not the case uh, for much of the, United, the history of the United States. That really was ushered in by this vast and acute out-migration that really started in this 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s era where African Americans were moving from the Deep South, from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and relocating to cities like New York, Detroit, uh, cities in Connecticut, um, and all across the country, California, and what have you. But there were many, many layover stops along the way, and that's the sweet story about Black Appalachia it was one of those layover stops where perhaps we, you know, um, black folks didn't stay there forever. Uh, in the case of Lynch, Kentucky, and Benham, Kentucky, and Harlem County, there are very few black families left. But for a point in history, for a time, that was home where black life thrived and was vibrant, and it was a place where we really made something. Um, uh, beautiful um, that left a lasting impression not just on African American history but on American history so those places are not to be forgotten the contributions that black Americans have had uh, to the region in a sense it's still home to you isn't mm -hmm. it? It's, it's still home. Your and roots I never, are there. The yeah. roots are there. Yeah. And I never answered the question. Yes, they had cousins <laughs> and aunties <laughs> and uncles and all of that. And that's how, like my parents, uh, just like Ron did, you don't go someplace where you don't know nobody. You go where you Auntie Nim are at that's or right. where your cousins or your that's big right. brothers or sisters are at. And that's how they then um, began to imagine uh, new lives for themselves, and they did it. Mm -hmm. It was Was that amazing. due to the manufacturing jobs that was? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you could really just map on um, the hot spots of that out-migration mm -hmm. along with, uh, you know, the motor industry yes. in Detroit mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, manufacturing in Chicago, uh, 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 government jobs in D.C. Mm -hmm. and New York. They followed the jobs, just like their parents had done before. It's like, where is the opportunity? And that's where they went. And the desegregation of the military. Yes, right. yes. Part of that. Mm. Which is also interesting, which, thinking about like the deindustrialization process that happened after those, and, and thinking about um, like Ron returns to home, right? I um, mean, we see that sort of people coming back in their, when they're, when they're older, right? A lot of these populations, that we have in the region are elderly. So people who stayed or people who returned maybe to at later in life, um, maybe to take care of, a, of an aging parent, and now themselves are, they're aging, right? Um, and so, now that like you, Ron, <laughs> you're not aging, <laughs> not at all, <laughs> not at all. But if, you know, we, we, it makes us think about like how these out migrations have shaped uh, these spaces, right, um, and sort of what's what's left uh, in these spaces. And, and, and Karina, you always return. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't have no choice. From my mother's <laughs> womb all the way up, my parents would uh, bring all of us back up to the mountains from New York to Kentucky. It is a 13-hour drive. I know because my father had one of these, um, you know, those luxury vans, those big old, va like the Scooby-Doo van from back in the day. <laughs> okay, van. we, in our mind, that's, the, daddy called it a luxury <laughs> yeah. van, okay? I don't know how he did this, but we would stuff all of my aunts and uncles on the brown side in that van and all the kids, so all my cousins. We'd pack into that van, it'd be at least 200 of us <laughs> in, in one car. 
And uh, it, it, my mother would pack cakes, pound cake, chicken, chips, candy, I mean, just everything you wanna, wanna think of. And we'd take that ride multiple times a year, but always Memorial Day every year. And that's when, for at least Harlan County, the black community has this beautiful tradition of every family goes home during Memorial Day. That's where, you know, when grandma and grandpa were alive, you get to see your grandparents, all your extended family, but then all the other, um, my parents got to see their classmates. So they never lost touch with the folks they went to first and second grade with. They'd known them their whole lives and have stayed in touch through these rituals and beautiful practices, going home for Memorial Day, and also the Eastern Kentucky Social Club, where they've gotten together every year for the last, what, 52 years now? 52 years. 53 years now? So home, even though the folks may not live there anymore, we might not have a physical presence in the region, it's always going to be home, and we're continuing to make and remake that through culture. And that's Decoration Day, too. Like that weekend is when you go and decorate the graves. Oh, yeah, well. yes. And you know, the, the, the cemetery, the, the main cemetery is located in Cumberland, Kentucky, and those cemeteries are segregated. Mm -hmm. So there is a black side and a white side to the cemetery, and what ended up happening over time, those traditions don't break. So like, for example, the Browns, all my family were buried next to each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a ritual to go home and dress those graves to honor our, you know, our ancestors and to stay in place mm -hmm. so that, that um, those mountains matter mm -hmm. a great deal. When I go, I'll have a little piece of me put there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speak, well, speaking mm. of, of reclaiming home and the mm. mountains matter, Ron, can you tell us a little bit about your return home and um, what, is, what did sort of reclaiming home feel? What did that look like for you? Yeah. After many, many years in uh, the Boston area, um, my wife and I, well, I convinced my wife to, to relocate. And I remember her one Sunday morning, she said, I give you five years. <laughs> and that five years turned into like 35 years, oh so she, she stayed. But um, <clears throat> I would come home every Christmas and I would just see people just dying. There was no young, um, um, African-American kids in the area, and I knew it was a dying culture. And the little one-room school that um, I attended um, was going to be torn down. Um, they, was, they consolidated high school. I think they built Lee High School, and uh, uh, they closed all the other schools because after integration, the little one-room school that, that I attended became a Head Start Center for many years, from 1965 up until 1980, uh, somewhere around there. So they're going to tear it down. And uh, I knew my great-great-grandmother built the building so that the black children of uh, Lee County would have a school to go to. So um, Jill and I went to work in trying to preserve the culture of, of, uh, of Lee County. Um, and we knew we had to do it fast because it was an elderly population there. Um, to give you some numbers, it's probably today there's like maybe 2,000 people in Pennington Gap and there's less than 20 African Americans. Mm. And of those 20, I would say 10 to 12 or, or my age, 60 and, and older. Um, in, in the whole high school, I think we have three three kids, three black kids in the whole high school. So we knew it, it was a dying culture. And uh, so we um, um, bought an old camcorder back in the 80s and put on that shoulder. So we started doing oral histories. Um, we had no knowledge, so we, um, we partnered with the Apple Shop in yes. Watchburg, uh, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. They taught us how to facilitate um, um, oral histories. And we did some work with Highlander. And um, so we just started documenting um, the, the culture around the coal fields of Southwest Virginia. And then we figure um, we got some interest in Northeast Tennessee, Eastern Kentucky, and, and it just snowballed after that. 
and that work continues on. You're not done. Oh no, that. we're not. No, we're not finished. We still, still continuing to uh, to do. We have a tradition in the mountains that we call Eighth of August, and that's our Emancipation Day. And uh, the center started five years ago, having a, a Eighth of August celebration. Um, with the help of uh, Black and Appalachia. Uh, it's, a, it's a tradition now, and it gets bigger and bigger every year. And this year, there were two buses <laughs> from, from Lynch. Yes! Yeah. Came over. Came over. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The Masseys. Mm -hmm. That's right, the Massey family. Okay, yeah. all right, shout out to the Masseys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, what... What do you see when you, because you've been coming home mm -hmm. all these summers, what have you seen change over time and like what, what, what are you seeing now in Lynch and Benham? A similar story to what Ron shares, um, you know, a dwindling of just a depopulation in general. So what, there might be 200 families living in Lynch right now um, and that's even more um, sharp when it comes to uh, black families. So it's a similar population decline that does have a racial dimension to that. Um, you know, so the town is becoming more and more a place of memory mm -hmm. than it is, a, you know, a, a place of, you know, new life and, and community. So it's important to preserve these histories in every way we can Yes, through archives, yes. through oral histories, yes. but also in the ways that we gather and eating together, preserving our food ways and traditions, mm -hmm. way of speaking and respecting our elders and communicating with one another. These are all things that I carry with myself in my everyday life that when I do them, the way I be with you is an archive itself of where I'm from mm -hmm. and that place. All right, that's it. Let's get out of here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but going into the future, Ron, like you've also, there's the work of the Cultural Center, which is preserving the, the narratives, but you've also working to make Southwest Virginia a better place for young people and people to live. I mean, you're doing, you do anti-racism work. Yes, you do, uh, you worked with uh, community remembrance projects around uh, lynchings that have occurred in the region. So it's, it's not static and black and white and dead work. Your wife was the uh, mayor, vice mayor. Of Pennington. Of Pennington Gap, and so. That was really weird because Pennington is, <laughs> you figure, first of all, she's a female. Now she's a black female. And she was a Bostonian. And how did she get elected three terms? Mm -hmm. you know, we just don't know, but she did. Uh, but Jill was a talker, so, yeah. and, and a visionary. Too. One of the things that we are always sort of pondering um, when we drive through the region, you know, are these spaces, uh, whether it be schoolhouses or churches or cemeteries, those are usually what we find. And, you know, we always stop and check them out and read a little bit about the history. And, and some of them are being lost now. And it's, it's a hard thing to sort of reconcile the spaces that meant so much to communities um, and still do, right? Mm -hmm. But because of this depopulation, um, you know, it, it, it seems like, um, what do we make? What do we make of the physical spaces? That's mm -hmm. sometimes really hard. Like, what does preserving them look like, and for whom? Especially when we think about like how uh, places change and gentrification, even mm -hmm. rural gentrification, and all of these things. What are, what are what are black spaces without black, without pe black people? Right. right. Um, what do you all? Mm. Well, I I want to make a, a larger remark to that. Um, and then just talk about from my family's perspective. The larger comment is, although these spaces and places are, are suffering from mass exodus and depopulation, and that is largely because of the occupational 
you know, uh, reality there. There are not a lot of jobs, and um, the land is being used in different ways that then articulates the way that people move in and out of space. These are not static places, and it's not that there is there are, there isn't vibrant life still in Appalachia, still in these former coal towns. Um, so I want to just make sure that I mark that that the folks who stayed, and there are some folks also who choose to go back from Boston and say, we're going back home, and we're going to uh, be keepers of this place, not just the history, but envision futures. There's a lot of that going on. So I just want to mark that, that we don't have to think about these as these like bygone places that aren't full of life. However, uh, you know, just recognizing the reality that, but they are, they are not the same as what they were, and places change. DC has changed a lot since I used to be partying here in my 20s, but that's a whole other podcast, okay? Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's in the small acts. There's this uh, uh, Caribbean saying, small acts fells big trees, okay? Uh, in my family, just this simple small act of we never sold our family homes. So on the Davis side and the Brown side, in Lynch, the most valuable real estate in that community is on First Street and Second Street, if you black, okay? And we kept our homes. Um, now, many homes on those streets are abandoned. Some have been torn down. Uh, some are falling down. But we hold on to our properties and keep those houses new. I could, if I lost everything today, I would be happy to move right on back to Lynch um, and, and I'd have a place to stay. But it's more than just, you know, even if nobody ever lives in those homes, we will keep them. We will make sure to do that because it's a part of, it's a part of being a keeper and also continuing no matter what to, for us, those cemeteries will keep, will keep it in the family forever. I will always go to honor my grandmother and grandfather, my one great grandfather who's there, my eight, nine, 10 now, oh my God, it's just been so many aunts and uncles on the Brown and Davis side who've passed, neighbors and friends. We don't forget them. We go back for our folks and we honor them and remember them. So even if it's just a day ride with my daddy, because daddy's still Richard Brown, he goes to Lynch probably twice a month nowadays mm -hmm. in his retirement. I'll ride up with daddy and we might spend an hour or two and just say hey to everybody at the cemetery, ride through the streets and you won't see anybody. But it's important to just do that. Um, and as long as we're alive, those are the little things that we do. But so many other people do their thing in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Should we open it up for questions? I like that. Yeah. So we have two mics here. If you all want to ask a question. This isn't Donahue. We're not going to bring it to you. you got to come down here. All right. Oh, she says she has a couple questions. <laughs> All right. That'll make people walk down. <laughs> Your name is Karita? Yes, Karita. My grandfather's. Your grandfather. How long did he live? Ooh, okay, so granddaddy uh, uh, Thornton Davis lived to in, well into his 80s, and Major lived almost to 80. He didn't make it to 80, but almost to 80 years old. When I hear coal mines, I always think of you know, the conditions and then yes. the plots. Boston, you brought your wife back. Did you all have children? 
Yes, we did. Uh, actually, um, we adopted our son uh, in Boston. We, had, we, we married in 1977, and um, we left Boston in the early 80s, and we adopted our son. And two years in the mountains, um, our daughter was born. So, okay. yes. And they are no, my son works here in D.C., and my daughter is a, a psychiatrist in uh, Bristol, Virginia. And, and this is an important point that you raise when your question about uh, lifespan, like how long did my grandfathers live because they mined coal. This points to uh, food waste. Okay, so mining absolutely was and still is one of the most dangerous jobs that any human, human being can do, okay? Um, you're, you're exposed to so many occupational hazards, especially during that time, black lung. So many men did die young, not only from black lung, but the mines could collapse on you at any point. So, you know, um, there were all sorts of ways that it could be a short life. However, um, and again, particular to the time that my grandfathers were working during this Jim Crow era, coming from Alabama, what was their specialty? What were they doing as little kids in Alabama? They were working on farms. They were part of sharecropping families. So almost every black family in, in Lynch and Benham had a garden, and I'm using that in a small way. They really had farms going all the way up the sides of the mountains. So before you had Whole Foods, women like my grandmothers, you know, the kids would go help daddy in the garden after he's working. The women would can these fresh organic foods, uh, cook fresh foods, wring chickens' necks, have fresh eggs. So their food ways were so um, healthy and organic. I, I think that that's an element that really um, uh, contributed. contributed to their long absolutely. lives. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother lived to 93, but it's basically the process they did. Yeah. And they, my they, grandfather, they, they made medicines out of yeah. roots and yeah. things like that, too. My grandfather worked over 50 years in a coal mine, and he lived to be 96. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he also suffered from co-workers pneumoconiosis, or black lung disease. Um, but he lived with it, and, uh, and had two brothers killed side by side mm -hmm. in the mines with, uh, when the top fell in. Mm -hmm. He called it a coal boom. He called it a coal what? Coal boom, where the floor and the ceiling come right. together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You talked about maintaining the property and you still have it in your family, but do the younger generations have the same interests that your generation has? And what do you do? What have you done to protect that property when it passes on? Mm. So um, I count myself in the younger generation. <laughs> yeah. But I mean oh, after but, you. Yeah. But, but um, I, I'll. I, I mentioned that to say um, even my generation, so those of us who our parents grew up there, we didn't, but we still have a direct relationship with going back in our lifetime. Even my generation, for the most part, that, that relationship isn't as strong. Um, however, it's mainly through not the place itself, but these organizations like the Eastern Kentucky Social Club. This is one of the longest standing uh, African American social clubs, an auxiliary organization that exists not for economic reasons, not for political reasons, but purely for, for a social gathering. Um, they've been meeting in different cities across the country uh, for the last 50 plus years. And that's a space where you'll still see the younger generations come. And that's where stories get passed down and through the dinners and the dancing and the, you know, um, it, the, the glamour of those weekends. A little bit of that cultural pre preservation happens there. Um, but Memorial Days are 
every year fewer and fewer people um, and less and less um, memory be, mm. to keep to sustain that kind of attachment to place it's really through memory that's how you maintain a heritage and a culture and a lot of younger folks like my nieces and nephews they don't know the stories so they don't have that heart connection like like I would or many people from my generation many of whom don't go don't go back I would add though that there are groups like stay um, mm -hmm. like the stay project yeah. that's working to try to keep young folks where possible or to at least uh, remember, remember the stories and to sort of ground people in those stories. And, and those uh, young folks come from all over the region, but it's what, 18 to 25? Mm -hmm. 18 to 25, and Highlander sort of um, hosts that program. But I think that that's one effort that we're seeing across the region mm -hmm. to really a, a connect with younger folks and to remind them and to um, help to celebrate their Appalachian-ness. And for some, staying is an option, and for some, it's not, you know. And it's about resources. They have right. to have jobs. These young people have to be able to right. pay their bills and mm -hmm. pay their car payment. And right. So. Um, my question is for Dr. Brown or for Ron. Um, I know, like, there are towns in Appalachia that are really trying to rebrand into outdoor tourism mm -hmm. to try to revitalize and um, help the economy. Is that an option for black communities? Before my wife passed, she was a vice mayor of Pennington for a number of years, and um, she actually, um, the town council worked very hard on um, destination location or something similar to that, um, where they actually built up the uh, Lehman Field area, our, our theater, the, the Lee Theater and everything, and we had hoped that tourism would, would take off um, our, um, ATV trail um, was one of the hardest trails I think in the nation they advertise it as so but f as for jobs we haven't seen any any jobs I don't think uh, uh, it hasn't brought any African American back to the to the area we do have a federal prison mm -hmm. um, which um, um, most of the employees that are uh, of color lives in Kingsport Tennessee not in Lee County, Virginia. Yeah, and a similar situation in Harlan County. So we haven't seen a, a flush of revitalization. There's been attempts and talks about similar with the ATV trails. And I mean, for, for folks who haven't been to these areas, they are beautiful. They are beautiful. In similar ways, like other mountain communities, like. Asheville and prayers go out to the folks at Asheville right now um, or other beautiful preserved mountainous ecosystems that are gorgeous that are that are resort towns that tourist industry bypassed coal camps because during the times when mining was active the last thing a coal company wants are tourists because tourists are going to push an environmental agenda to preserve that, and that's a, you know, that's antithetical to what the company wants. So that infrastructure uh, was never really cultivated in these areas, and it hasn't yet taken off. I have hopes uh, for that, and if it does happen, it, there is absolutely a huge opportunity for African Americans should be taking. A, a major role in shaping what sure. that future looks like, um, especially through reclamation projects. People who have ties to this region coming back and raising their hand and saying, I want to be a part of the freedom dreams that, you know, rest in this place and imagining what, you know, for the next, what is for the 20th century, what do these um, communities look like? But to William's point, if you can't feed your family, and if the jobs just aren't there, and the school infrastructure isn't there, um, you know, that kind of forecloses that second step of, you know, participating in new industry. 
We have a question from our online audience. Uh, I guess it could be for anybody or all of you. Uh, the, the viewer asks, uh, from your experience and your observations, what have you found to be the most productive spaces for young black people? Cities. Appalachian cities. Appalachian cities. Maybe what, Knoxville, what, Pittsburgh. What Tell comes it. to mind when you think yeah. of Appalachian cities and oh, for right. young black people? <laughs> well, I mean, the, there <laughs> things are slim there too in those spaces too. I mean, and when I say cities, I mean urban spaces in the region. And things are slim in Knoxville and Pittsburgh, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, there was this article about Pittsburgh being one of the worst places for black women to live, right? So. It, you just have maybe a f more options than you might in a more rural setting, um, but nevertheless, it, you know, you're dealing with a whole lot of racism, to be honest, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I don't, I think, movement. What, say the question again. I feel like it's a big question. The question, the question reads, um, what have you noticed that have been the most productive spaces for young black people? In the region, state. The bottom bookstore. Sure, the bottom bookstore is a great space. And, and so for tell the people. people about the bottom bookstore and, and <laughs> what kind of space that is. Uh, <laughs> the bottom is a, a community bookstore and art space in Knoxville. Again. In, the, in, the, in some urban centers, you have a little bit more. You might have more resources to maybe be able to do more. So it's a space where we have a lot of people in their early 20s, um, early, to, early to late 20s, actually, um, who are creating what they need. What, and, and it's really they're creating community and they're creating art. They're creating, um, they're, they're involved in these very, um, um, artistic creative making projects. So it's a bookstore, but it's also an art studio. We have a, a budding ceramics program and a podcast studio and lots of books, right? Um, and, and we have a, another version of that at, at, at 113, right? But it is just that you probably have few less traffic, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think people are trying, right? I think the, the again, state, the state project, I get, is a space where people are trying to create what they need. But again, when the economics are not there, it's really hard, right? So even those young people at the bottom who are able to, able to feed themselves through community and through art and through um, you know, a, 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 a social life, they're having a hard time feeding themselves food mm -hmm. and rent and, and these things. So, you know, it, it, you can't be mad at folks for leaving for better opportunities. That's what their ancestors did, mm -hmm. right? They left Alabama, for example, for a better opportunity. Yep. And so, like you said, this, 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 uh, this, this um, forward moving is, is a part of, of who black Appalachians are, many yeah. of them, right? And so people do what they need to do. So, and, and it's hard to say to stay. It's hard to say stay when I can't give you something viable, right? right. Um, and so we try to hold the stories. That's why we made this podcast so that folks in D.C. who might need to, to you know, who have Appalachian roots but needed to, to leave for whatever reason can still connect with home, can mm -hmm. still connect with their family stories, can still go searching where, you know, for, for, for more of their own stories where we might not be able to find, right? So I think we create what we need with what we have, but mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still hard. Yeah. I'm going to shut up now. That's a good job. Yeah, I try. <laughs> okay, I had a quick follow up about that, um, about places that are kind of um, maybe healthy or good for black people in Appalachia. Do you have any thoughts on Roanoke? They got a black mayor, a sheriff, black city council, black queer and trans organizations. What's your take? I think places where we've seen more robust and healthy black life are places that have some kind of political representation. We've just got a, a black mayor in Kingsport, Tennessee. And you know, even places like where Ron's wife was the vice mayor in Pennington Gap, you saw just her being in that elected position, those conversations could shift and she could be there to shift the conversations when things got weird with the city council or the county commission. And so I think 
at the very base level, basically, pol black political representation in these spaces is important to even, for people to even consider being there, I think, and for the conversation to not be um, harmful. But it's a struggle, right? Even for people to get into those offices. I mean, I, I can speak for Knoxville because that's where I've spent more time and did work, but you have folks on the ground who are really like involved in real movement work to make it so that people can get into those offices, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and push back and hold them accountable when, when they need to be held accountable in some cases. Um, but I think that that is, a, that is hard work, even for a young person like me, had to tap out at some point because it's a constant, it's a constant battle, probably is everywhere or anywhere, but it is not just, it's not automatic by no means. I think even when we have people in power, it's not automatic. No. There's a lot of work on the ground to make these things happen, to make, you know, opportunities for black folks happen. But I'm a sociologist, I'm a um, the last sentence in, so I wrote a book on this particular um, in and out migration called Gone Home, Race and Roots Through Appalachia. And this conversation is making me think about the very last sentence of that book. And it is, this is the improvisation of blackness. And I conclude that book with that sentence because it's a statement about this the relationship that African Americans do and have always had with this concept of home. Mm -hmm. We've always had to be forward-minded, forward-thinking. Uh, we've always had to improvise ourselves. It's jazz. It is not a um, leaving everything behind. It is we're remixing mm -hmm. at all times. From the second that we were stolen and brought to this country, it is improvising what does African-American culture mean then in absence of home in Africa. It is migrating from saying, I'm getting off of this plantation, uh, out of this sharecropping situation, how do I remake myself having to move to this place uh, that is unknown? It is the improvisation of my parents who said, who were told, you can't stay here even though your whole life and everything you've ever known is here. And with those moves are improvisations of culture, of self-expression, of placeness, of culture. And I think that says a lot about the archive, uh, the African-American archive. Yes, you can find it in place, but it's, in, it's like Fred Moten said, it's in the break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got to catch that. It's something else. And that's where soul comes from. And you know, it's it's an artistic expression of the self is how I think about um, what this whole thing of migration and place has meant to us as a people. Done. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. You, I think that's a great <laughs> close for our this evening's close. conversation. Um, and we thank all of you for coming out and. Uh, sharing with us and talking with us and listening to us. We thank our podcast crew uh, at East Tennessee PBS. We thank the Black and Appalachia crew and all the places where they are. Um, and we thank the National Archives for inviting us here this evening. This was a wonderful experience. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you. You did that. Are we off the air? Y'all did that. Are we, are we off the air? Are we off, are we off the air? Suzanne Oakwood. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. I saw all three of y'all the whole <laughs> yeah, time, I did. just yeah. like, yep. And I said, okay, okay. <laughs>